we want to talk a little bit now about Germany and, and, and kind of where it comes from militarily and why it is. Germany is a very militaristic society uh, for many reasons. And part of that has to do with geography, right? Now, prior to 1870, as we know, Germany was about 30 or 40 little kingdoms and states. And then prior to 1806, it was the Holy Roman Empire, where you had maybe about 1,000 little principalities and kingdoms. So, so the Germans have always been either either locally or kind of empirically, empirically um, surrounded by enemies. And so you have to develop military skills in order to protect yourselves and protect your homelands. Now, the dominant culture of Germany in the, 20, in the early 20th century is that of Prussia. Okay? Now, Prussia is, today it's a federal state in Germany. It's the largest federal state in Germany. Its capital is Berlin. Okay? So it is the largest federal state in Germany. But it was, of course, one of the larger German kingdoms, historically. And so it is under Prussia that Germany will unify in 1871. And the king of Prussia will become the Kaiser, or the emperor of Germany. But Prussia has had, of course, no small, over the course of the, like the, the 17th into the 18th century, no small share of rivals, including the Austrians, the Russians, the Swedes, the Swedish, the French. All of these were bigger than Prussia, and it had plenty of smaller uh, states, too, that could threaten them. And they all compete for centuries for territory in kind of central Europe, in central Europe. The Prussian military was not particularly wealthy, and in order to compete with its, its, its enemies in this disadvantageous region of Germany, it develops, it develops a really important military, a, 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 a very good military. Small, but good. And, and very harsh. Discipline in the, in the Prussian military was, was very, very harsh. And um, they, had the, they had the harshest uh, kind of punishments in just about any European state at the time. And one of the doctrines that the, that the Prussians had developed was strike first, strike hard, you know, knock your enemy off balance, win the war in the first big push, right, in the first big battle here. You want to have overwhelming localized numbers and just go and, and, and hit them as hard as you can. And m a good number of the military commanders in Germany during World War II uh, will be of kind of Prussian military stock. It will come from these Prussian military families that have had all of these kinds of ideas incul incul inculcated into them, not just from the state, but from their own family as well. In fact, under Frederick the Great, under Frederick the Great, who was quite a character, under Frederick the Great, um, there was the saying that, that Prussia is not a state that has an army. Prussia is an army that has a state. To, to kind of give you an idea of just how military-minded the Prussians were at this time. And you can see here Prussian formation, Seven Years' War. This is linear warfare, right? We're all in a line. We're marching forward. Far more important than the muskets are the bayonets at this period. Now, during the 1920s and 1930s, during the 1920s and 1930s, military thinkers throughout the world, but in particularly in Germany, are looking at the lessons of World War I. We had the trenches. We had these, these moments where we're trying to go over the top, over the trenches to get at our enemies. And, of course, the problem was in World War I, when World War I breaks out, military technology had developed to the point where it favored the defense. Military technology favored the defense. The big one, the machine gun. A machine gun fundamentally is not an offensive weapon. It is a defensive weapon. But also, too, things you wouldn't even think about, like barbed wire. Barbed wire is an important piece of military technology that, again, heavily favors the the uh, the defense. So so much of World War One was all about trench warfare, staying in the trenches, fighting in the trenches, and then when you've got to, you make a big push, 
and you send as many guys as you can, and you hope that some of them are left to do the job when they get to the next trench, right? It's, it's, it's bloody, it's brutal. Men are used as cannon fodder. It's a horrible, horrible way to fight a war. It's an inefficient way to fight a war, and ultimately it is a failure of a way to fight a war. I watched, I just the other night I watched uh, one of my favorite films, uh, Paths of Glory. Has anybody ever seen Paths of Glory? It's one of Kubrick's first films. It's absolutely a brilliant. It's with Kirk Douglas, and he's a French colonel, and he's ordered to, to send his men over the top. And, it's, it's, and, of course, they can't take the position, so they try some of the men in the regiment for cowardice. And it's, it's a brilliant film. I highly recommend you check it out if you get a chance. Brilliant film. Well, by, as a result of World War I, and, and as these people in the 20s and 30s are thinking about that war... And as technology is changing, they're saying, well, can we not adapt newer technologies to overcome those problems of the First World War, of the trenches, of the barbed wire, of the machine guns? Now, right at the end of the war, you started to have the beginnings of some of these things. You start to see the appearance of the tank toward the end of the war, which is really fundamentally a way of putting metal in between you and the machine guns, right? But these World War I tanks are big, they're heavy. Sometimes, you know, you have 10 men inside one tank. The temperature would be you know, 130 degrees or something like that in there, men would faint. I mean, it was not practical, but they become more practical in the interwar period. And tanks, too, fundamentally are seen as a way to replace traditionally like what cavalry did. Cavalry could get behind the enemy fairly swiftly. Well, cannot tanks do the same thing? And there's this idea of we need to find a way to bring mobility back to the battlefield. Okay? Mobility back to the battlefield. We need to f find a way to bring mobility back to the battlefield. So what thinkers in Germany come up with, what thinkers in Germany come up with is a new kind of military formation. Now we talked about, on the first day, we talked about basic military formations, basic army formations. And the one that I said is, is, is very significant is, of course, the division. So the Germans are going to find a way to create a division, essentially have that kind of mobility to the kinds of weapons and, 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 and what have you in order to bring mobility back to the battlefield. And what they come up with here is something called the Panzer Division. The Panzer Division. Panzer is the German word for armor. Armor. Armor is what you kind of more formally refer to as tanks. We call tanks informally tanks, but a bit, a bit more formally we call, them, we call them armor. And of course, I hope you all have been following the news about Germany sending leopard tanks to Ukraine, which uh, for the first time you're going to see German tanks fighting Russians again since World War II. The Soviets aren't, or the Soviets, the Russians aren't happy about this, is because a tank, as we're seeing here with the Germans in 1939, a tank fundamentally is an offensive weapon. It is a weapon around which all combined arms, infantry, artillery, mounted cavalry, even air power, revolves around. If you are attacking, the tank is the centerpiece of the attack. Okay. So, so what we're doing in sending those tanks to Ukraine today is we're essentially saying we want them to go on the offensive. We want the Ukrainians to take the offensive. So that's one of the things that's scaring the Russians today. Ideally, ideally, all military weapons, though, even though they're capable of killing people, the point of a military weapon is not to kill people. It's to deter wars, at least from a Western standpoint. It is to deter wars. Uh, I certainly don't think the Germans have any designs on gaining Lebensraum or anything this time. But, um, and it was, it was a big deal. It was a big deal for the Germans because the Germans are aware of the stigma of the damage they did in World War II. And that's one of the reasons why they were very reluctant to commit their tanks to battle um, even though they're not the ones that are going to use them. Each Panzer Division holds roughly 300 tanks. 300 tanks. The most... Uh, let's see, do I have it here? Yeah, the, well... No, I don't have it there. The most significant here is... The, or these tanks here. I thought I had a header there. But these are the Panzer IVs. The Panzer IVs. Panzer number 4. Armor number 4. These were medium tanks... They're not particularly powerful against some of these heavier tanks, as we'll see, but they get the job done, particularly earlier in the war, and they're fairly mobile. They're fairly quick, relatively quick. So each Panzer Division contains roughly 300 tanks. But it's not just 300 tanks, boom, that's a Panzer Division. 
As I say, we simply build our combined arms around the tanks, which means with the tanks, we also have motorized infantry. Motorized infantry. We have a, a significant number of trucks whose job it is to carry infantry, and then if, 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 if we meet resistance, the infantry can quickly unload and, and engage with that. But also, too, another incredibly important part of the Panzer Division, each of these tanks and constituent elements all have signals units, and they all have radios. Each tank has a radio so that you can actually radio for uh, air assistance from the Luftwaffe. Now, in a way, the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, is going to take on the role traditionally held by artillery. Normally, if you're fighting, you get to a strong point, you've got to take that strong point, you bring in your heavy guns. Your heavy guns start shelling it, you're able to take it. We're moving so fast, it takes a long time to bring the guns up and to get them ready. It's easier just to call in an airstrike. You call in an airstrike, they take it out so you can go through. But, but also, critically, too, a big part of this idea here is you want your tanks, your, your mobile elements, to essentially not engage with strong points and take them, but go around them so they can surround them, cut their supply lines, cut their communications, and then other forces can come up from the rear and kind of mop up, right? That's kind of the idea here. And so to this extent, the Panzer Division will restore mobility to the battlefield. It will restore mobility after the stagnant way World War I was fought. Now, I believe it is Time Magazine will actually call what they're seeing here, they'll call this the Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg. Blit, literally, this means lightning war. They'll say this is the Blitzkrieg. And this catches on, and pretty soon... A lot of people, even Germans, use that term, Blitzkrieg. But that is not what the Germans initially call it. That's not what the Germans designed. They actually call it Bewegungskrieg. Bewegungskrieg. War of movement. War of movement. So this is a revolution. This is literally a revolutionary new type of warfare. Now, as I say, other people were looking at this in, in France... Among others, Charles de Gaulle was really proposed, you know, a proponent of, of tanks and this kind of warfare. In the Soviet Union, I believe we talked about a few weeks ago, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, he was designing something that was very similar to this. He called it deep operations before he was killed. In the United States, you would have some tank officers that were really thinking tanks were the way to go, but unfortunately there was l virtually no budget in the 1920s and 1930s for the military. The United States just was not paying for a military... And so we couldn't develop stuff like this in the United States at the time. Hitler wanted war. He's preparing for war. He is, he's doing this. And one thing, too, about Hitler is Hitler backs the military innovators. Hitler backs the military innovators. One of the greatest innovators here was a guy named Heinz Guderian. He was a general named Heinz Guderian. And he backs Guderian. He's also going to back um, airborne operations. There's a guy named Kurt Student who was a Luftwaffe general. Student, just like your students. His name was Kurt Student. And he um, essentially says we can, we can get past strong points, we can by, bypass places using large airborne operations. And Hitler's going to back that guy as well. So Hitler, he was a gambler, and he backs military innovators. Okay? He backs military innovators. And again, and I'll, we'll, we'll get into this more as we go on, there's always this, there's this trend, there's this, this idea because we hate Hitler because he was an asshole, which he was, we tend to think, he was a complete idiot when it came to military matters, and that's not true. I think Hitler was actually a very, very good military strategist until about Stalingrad when he just kind of surrenders that to wishful thinking. But early in the war, I think Hitler was actually quite astute in many military matters, and many of his generals were really good captains but not necessarily great strategists. And we'll, we'll discuss this more as we go on. Now, um, so Hitler goes to war here in Poland in 19... 39. There he is with von Brastisch, the commander-in-chief of the army. Just, just to let you know, the, the, the vast majority of the German army looks exactly like it did in World War I. That is to say, conventional infantry. Okay. In fact, there were about 100 divisions in Germany. Germany had about 100 divisions. Of those, six were panzer divisions. Six were panzer divisions. Um, most people, most soldiers in World War II are going to go to war the same way their fathers did, 
on their feet with horses carrying their supplies. Germany will maintain a huge stable of horses, and one of their biggest logistical issues of the war will be keeping their horses fed, okay? particularly when they start fighting in Russia. Now, by contrast to this, the French have 90 divisions. The French have 90 divisions. Britain only has about 10 army divisions ready to deploy to France. Only about 10 divisions ready to deploy to France. Poland has somewhere on the order of 30 divisions. 30 divisions. They've got some other constituent or uh, auxiliary elements, rather. Um, they've got some cavalry brigades. They've got about 12 cavalry brigades, and they also have one armored brigade. They have one armored brigade of tanks. Now, there's this story that maybe some of you might have heard. Uh, and this was repeated by um, William Shirer, who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. But the, theory, the, the story is that in the midst of the German invasion of Poland, as the tanks are rolling in, you actually have Polish cavalry divisions with their lances charging tanks. Okay? A lot of people talk about this. Oh, the Polish, they knew they were going to win, but they, but they charged these tanks with lances. It's total crap. Okay? Most cavalry divisions by this point are not cavalry like cavalry fought you know, in the 19th century. They're mounted infantry. They're essentially infantry officers. They ride on horses. When they see the enemy, they get off their horses, and they fight like infantry. It's just they use the horses to give them mobility. Okay? So that, that, that's a, that story's apocryphal. Uh, I actually had a, when I was working on my PhD, I, I had a friend of mine who was actually, he was interested in military history, but he wasn't really a military historian. He was, an inter, he was a historian of like folk history and stories and tall tales. And that was one, and he was actually researching that to show that didn't actually happen. That was just a tall tale. Well, <clears throat> the Germans have about 2,000 out aircraft, bombers and fighters, in this battle, in this campaign. 2,000 bombers and aircraft, 2,000 aircraft, bombers and fighters. Now, again, a bomber is a big, heavy, lumbering, multi -engine, usually multi-engine craft that drops bombs on specific targets. A fighter is a lighter, more nimble aircraft, usually one man, one engine, uh, not always, though, um, that is used to essentially protect and shoot down bombers and run interference for bombers. Stuka dive bomber is a single engine. It had, I think, two personnel in it. Um, and a lot of these are Stukas. As we're going to see, the Germans will develop a tactical air force uh, as opposed to a strategic air force, and we'll really get into the difference there later. But yeah, that's, that's uh, a lot many of these were. Probably the greatest fighter aircraft of the day is the British Spitfire fighter, okay? The British Spitfire. With the exception of the Spitfire, virtually all of the best aircraft come from Germany. Virtually all of the best state-of-the-art aircraft is being manufactured in Germany on the eve of war here. The Royal Navy is bigger and superior to the German Kriegsmarine. The Royal Navy is bigger and superior to the German Kriegsmarine. And while the Germans certainly have a larger army on paper, the British have many colonies and, and, and the Commonwealth, many other states they can draw on. In fact, the day that Britain declares war on Germany, which will be September 3rd, the day that, that Britain declares war on Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, all of these other states also declare war on, on Germany. And these are independent states. They didn't have to. But they agreed in, in, in what Britain was trying to do and what they were fighting for. So they all agreed. In World War I, most of them were still part of the British Empire. They didn't have a say. But in World War II, and they do have a say, they still agree to fight with the British Empire. And in fact, during much of the first part of the war, Canada will be supplying Britain, will be its kind of manufacturing supply center there. The same year the war breaks out, the Soviet Union boasts 300 divisions, 300 divisions, and 9,000 tanks, 9,000 tanks, many more than the Germans. However, most, the vast majority of Soviet tanks are obsolete, they're older, and most of their divisions are divisions kind of on paper. There's men there, but they don't have a lot of the equipment or basic stuff that they need, okay? They will field, however, two tanks. The Soviets will field two tanks in very small numbers that will grow, that will ultimately become some of the workhorses. Uh, I don't think I have it up there. No, okay. Uh, they, they will have the... Um, 
probably the greatest tank of the war, T-34 and the KV-1. T-34, will, uh, Heinz Guderian, again, the guy that develops these panzer tactics for Germany, he will later say that the T-34 is the best tank of the war. And we'll get more into this stuff, as I say, later. Soviets also have a very large air force, but again, largely obsolete aircraft. A lot of, like, biplanes, you know, and stuff like that. So it's a very obsolete. The United States here at the outbreak of war, the United States at the outbreak of war, the United States, of course, as I say, had intervened on the side of the Allies in 1917, but in 1939, Americans, nope, we're not getting involved this time. Have at it. We, we, it doesn't concern us. We're staying out of it. We'll get more into American isolation in a few, in a few units. We'll, talk, we'll go in depth in that. But just so you know, America does not want a part in this war. It doesn't want to get dragged in. The United States at this time has a very, very, very small standing army. A very small standing army. But what America does have at this time is the tremendous potential to mobilize. In fact, many people in Europe believe America, if it is mobilized, would have virtually inexhaustible resources. Not quite true, as we will see, but certainly it will have tremendous military and economic um, power that it will bring to bear in a war. But they don't want any part of it. And also, too, it can't just happen overnight. Certainly, it would take time to, to create that kind of infrastructure. But Hitler's decision to go to war in 1939 represents a gamble. With all these factors, all these people, potential belligerents and actual belligerents, it represents a gamble. And it's certainly not the last one Hitler will take. As I mentioned in my other class, you know this, Hitler is a gambler. Hitler always gambles. He always takes a chance. Sometimes these work out for him. Sometimes they don't. Any rational calculation of the potential forces that could be arrayed against Germany clearly show Germany can't win. But Hitler doesn't care. Hitler doesn't care. Hitler has faith in his army, in these new tactics, in this idea of speed, aggression. We can destroy enemies one by one through superior tactics. We can knock them down like dominoes. But critically, a big part of what's going to be the reason Hitler's so successful here at the beginning is it's initially, he's going to use surprise. Wherever Hitler can, he will use surprise. And once the initiative of surprise is spent, Hitler's forces typically will have a much more difficult time of being effective. Okay? If a planned sequence of events faltered, he always plans these sequences of events, if they falter, then of course it, the whole thing is going to fail. Now, right at the outbreak of war, had France invaded Germany proper, had they launched a proper invasion, who knows what would have happened. Hitler would have panicked. He would have pulled forces back from Poland. Who knows what would have happened there. The war could have ended in 1939. However, the French, except for this very brief little probing about 15 miles into Germany, they don't invade. They briefly go about 15 miles into Germany, say, oh, okay, that's good, and then they come back. Most of these other countries do not yet realize the potential of armor and of tanks. They see them primarily as defensive weapons, and Hitler is using them, obviously, as offensive weapons. So Hitler is going to use this gamble. So he invades Poland in... Any questions so far? Invades Poland in 1939. We have the Gleiwitz incident. He declares war... Uh, Germany declares war on September 1st. Tanks are sent in. You do have motorized divisions, too, some, some divisions that are just tr infantry and trucks, right, and, and constituent elements of trucks, but most of them are moving on foot. So the panzer divisions, they're your spearheads. They go in first. Then you've got motor divisions, motorized divisions following them up, and then following that, of course, you've got uh, the, the infantry, which are, which are much slower with equipment pulled by horses. Each infantry division has about 5,000 horses, about 5,000 horses. So about 300,000 horses participate in the invasion of Poland. About 300,000 horses participate in the invasion of Poland. The Poles don't really stand much of a chance. They just don't stand much of a chance. And their hope, their big hope, was France would invade Germany from the west or that maybe a, an amphibious force, uh, the, 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 the British somehow could, could make it through the Baltic and deliver a force to help them out in Poland, and of course, that's just wishful thinking. But nevertheless, the Poles resist fiercely. 
And then again, uh, so you can see you've got invasions coming from East Prussia, um, here, here, and even down here. So you've got pretty much the poles are just surrounded by three sides, essentially, the north, south, and, and uh, east, uh, or west, rather, and they are taken over quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, now, France and the United Kingdom declare war on Germany on um, September 3rd. They declare war on Germany on September 3rd, two days after the, the declaration. Um, but they're not, they're not particularly aggressive. Part of their reticence to launch major operations against Germany is due certainly in part to a fear of casualties. Um, they don't want to take, you, you know, again, the, the images of the Psalm and Verdun are kind of burned into their minds, and they, and they don't want to just throw men away just to look like they're doing something, right? But they're also terrified. They're amazed at the speed and the um, successes of the Wehrmacht in Poland, just how quickly they're able to overrun this, 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 this army. Now, certainly everyone on paper would expect a German victory, but they would have expected the Poles to at least hold out a little bit longer. On September 17th, on September 17th, the Soviet Union, in line with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, they invade Poland from the east. They invade Poland from the east. And most of Poland's military forces by that point were in the west fighting the Nazis. And so the, 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 the Soviets are able, with very little resistance, to move in to the, to the west there, or move in uh, from the east. So Polish resistance was already collapsing, and the Soviet invasion was just kind of the final blow there. In fighting the Germans, the Poles lost about 70,000 killed fighting the Germans, <clears throat> and they lose about 50,000 killed fighting the Soviets. 70,000 killed fighting the Germans, 50,000 killed fighting the Soviets. About 700,000 Poles become prisoners of war to the Germans. The Germans take 700,000 prisoners of war. The Soviets take about 300,000 prisoners of war. Now, by contrast to this, Germany lost just 11,000 dead, 11,000 dead, and 30,000 wounded. 11,000 dead and 30,000 wounded. The Russians lost about 700 dead, about 700 dead, and around 2,000 wounded. And around 2,000 wounded. The Soviets, the Germans, they meet right in the middle, and they split the country up between them. This is, oh, this is, um, that's, I think that's, I want to say Times Guderian, who's, who's kind of one of the top, uh, Hitler's top generals, he's really one of the guys in, in charge of creating the, the Blitzkrieg. He's uh, here, he and another German officer here with a Soviet officer, they're there smiling, they've just conquered Poland. So this is the Saar Offensive. I think I, I, mean, I think I mentioned this briefly last time, but this was actually the invasion of Germany by the French for about, they, they push in about 15 miles into Germany, and then they turn around and come home. Again, they're scared of launching a major operation. As I understand it, this was pretty much kind of a, a local initiative. This didn't come from above. These were kind of... Um, I think, I think I want to say division and core level operations into Germany. And, but they, but they, they're not there in strength. They're scared. Uh, arguably, had even at this level they pushed into Germany, they wouldn't have met too much resistance, and they probably could have eventually taken something like Munich, which could have really been a game changer. But they don't. They, they, they get scared, and they pull out. So we have now the phony war. The phony war. And the phony war, as I say again, lasts from roughly the fall of Poland until April of 1940. And we kind of refer to this as the Sitzkrieg. As opposed to the Blitzkrieg, it's the Sitzkrieg, meaning literally we're just sitting around. It's kind of a play on words here. Um, we don't see any major uh, ground operations during this period. During the six-month period, we don't see any major ground operations. You do have some artillery being fired back and forth along the Franco-German border. You do have some naval action. Certainly the U-boats are, are, are up and at it. 
Uh, you're going to have um, Gunther Preen, a U-boat captain, is actually going to sink a German battleship in Scapa Flow, which was the British main mooring for their fleet in Scotland, which was considered to be impenetrable, and a U-boat is able to navigate its way in there and blow up the Ark Royal. Uh, you also have, of course, um, there are several German warships, the Graf Spray, um, that you have battles that go on in the, in the Atlantic, but there's no major on-ground military operations during the six months here. You have the Polish government actually flees Poland, and they go to London. They set up shop in London. They create a government in exile in London. Now, Hitler's gamble in going into Poland it fundamentally pays off, and his prestige among the military really goes up. Because the military, as we saw with like the resignation of Ludwig Beck over the... Uh, the uh, Munich crisis, there was a lot of conservative pushback against Hitler, right? Hitler was always kind of at odds with, his, with conservative elements in German society. But now the military, which is profoundly conservative, is thinking, well, this guy maybe knows what he's doing. His popularity with the average German just continues to go up. I mean, this guy sounds like he can do no wrong. Every move he's made has paid off big time uh, to this point. And Germany, critically, had proven it was not this little weak thing that the Allies could push around like they did at Versailles. It's standing up for itself. It's reasserting itself. So most Germans were very, very happy. Um, but not everything is as glowing as German propaganda is presenting it to the German population. One of the big issues, and we'll see this again and again, with the Wehrmacht and with German, the German military, is there is an emphasis on operations, meaning... There's an emphasis on moving, maneuvering your armies into positions to deliver these knockout blows to your enemies. And that's kind of where they firmly place the emphasis. Operations, operations, operations. The problem is uh, an important part of operations, an important supporting part of operations, are things like intelligence. You need to know what the enemy is up to, where he is, what he's doing in order to counter him. And, of course, the other really important thing in, in, in military um, science, and particularly in modern military science, and that is logistics. How do you keep your army fed? How do you keep those tanks running? You know, a tank is a very sophisticated piece of machinery with hundreds of very important parts. And if just one of those parts breaks down, that tank may not be operable. So you have to keep all that stuff flowing from the factories to where it's needed in the front, okay? And the Germans... They, they, they de-emphasize things like logistics and, and intelligence in, in favor of just this, boom, you're going to go here and take this city, you're going to go here and you're going to take this city. And a lot of times it'll work, particularly if Germany's delivering a surprise attack, which they frequently do, where, where, where they just kind of unleash the Wehrmacht very suddenly and, and they do it. That is um, really where the Wehrmacht is going to shine. But as we'll see, as they, as they come into contact with armies that are better prepared, better ready for them, they don't do nearly as well as the war goes on. Now, one other thing happens here at this time, and that is the Poles, prior to the Second World War, the Poles had been, you'd had a number of Polish mathematicians who had been desperately trying to crack German military codes. So the Germans have this machine here called the Enigma. The Enigma. And it's got these, 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 these rotors here. You see the three of them here. Later versions will have more. These are called bombs. B-O-M-B-E-S. Bombs. And these are these kind of mathematical um, ciphers that they create different algorithms. I, I don't know if we can even call them algorithms at the time. I'm not a mathematician. But it creates these systems that allow... These, 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 these incredibly complex mathematical uh, codes to be written for simple messages. And what happens is, if you have one of these Enigma machines, and another unit has an Enigma machine, in theory, you can go ahead and discuss exactly what you want to discuss without anybody knowing what you're talking about. And of course, communications is something that is very important in warfare as well, and, and masking your communications. And um, 
remember I heard a thing once where they said, you know, the Germans, the Germans were very, when it came to stuff like this, the Germans were very, very, very clever. But they weren't so clever to, 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 to understand that other people could be just as clever as they were, right? And that was, that's, there's a little, there's a lot of hubris there among the, the Germans. Well, the Poles begin the process prior to the war of actually breaking this code. And they make significant, significant um, uh, headway in, in, in that. The British will make significant headway. But in 1939, the British had, done, had developed virtually no advanced code breaking against the Polish. Virtually none. It, or, I mean, against the Germans. It is the Polish code breakers that when they first, when they flee Poland, they go to Paris, then they go to London, and they bring with them all of their research into how to break these codes. And they begin the process of breaking the, the Enigma machine codes, which, again, is going to be absolutely essential. Um, in fact, uh, I think it's in Storm of War. He talks about the, the Desert War. When, we'll get to that in a few weeks when, when Rommel's fighting Montgomery, and they said, you know, people thought Montgomery was such a great general. It was like he could read Rommel's mind. And he says the fact of the matter was he was reading his mail because they had cracked the codes, right? But the Germans, pretty much throughout the war, remain unaware that this has happened. Bletchley Park was where the British will continue it because the, the issue is right at the beginning of the war, they, they are, they're, 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 they're working on Enigma. They're working on Enigma. But the big problem for the British is, of course, the U-boats. And there's a naval cipher, a naval U-boat machine, which is slightly, um, slightly different that they are going to have to work on. This fellow here... Marian Rajewski, he is one of the principal contributors. There were many, but this is uh, just one of them. He's got this, this uh, um, statue here in Poland that is dedicated to him and for the work he did, and they got that little Enigma machine right by him. But as I say, uh, Alan Turing, who is this fellow's father, Dermot, Dermot Turing's father in the video, uh, he, uh, or not his father, his uncle, uh, Alan Turing, of course, was one of the um, principal British uh, code breakers during the war that is able to understand, he's a mathematical genius, he's able to understand how the system works. And in fact, this Enigma machine and Turing, a lot of Turing's work to, to, to take it apart is primarily responsible for the development of computers. Modern computing really begins with this. They essentially build a computer to break the code. And one of the ways they do that is they realize they have to find something that's in every code to kind of get a baseline. And they, it occurred to them that at the, at the bottom of every German message were the words Heil Führer or Heil Hitler. And with that, they were able to say, okay, so we've got an H. We've got, you know, they were able to figure out all the, all the letters that they needed that, that then helped them create the machine. And Alan Turing, if you don't know, it's kind of a sad thing. He was gay, and he was... Um, ultimately was illegal, of course, in the time in Britain, and he's ultimately going to be chemically, chemically castrated, uh, and he will end up killing himself. And this is a guy that arguably was one of the major contributors to winning the war. Right? Um, incidentally, the Enigma machine, <coughs> excuse me, the Enigma machine, these are really popular collector's items today. People really hunt these things down. Mick Jagger, collects Enigma machines. Lauren Michaels, who, who is the producer of Saturday Night Live, he collects Enigma machines. So. Uh, any questions about that? Now, Hitler, his, his, he initially thought that his plan was just he would annex these western regions of Poland. He would annex these western regions of Poland. The Soviets could have the east. And then he'd let the Poles just kind of have their own thing there. But he decides he doesn't want the Poles to rule themselves. So he essentially creates in this rump part of Poland something he calls the general government, which in theory is kind of a puppet government, but the reality is the Poles have no autonomy. It's run by Germans. So it's, it's essentially kind of part of Germany, but there's this fiction that it's somehow a part, even though there's no autonomy. It has no autonomy whatsoever. And the idea was, like, that a lot of the Germans that settle it, Hans Frank, who leads it, they want to create this, like, model German state based upon what Germans were doing in World War I with this plan called Oberost, where they want to create this really efficient model society. But the reality is, as the war drags on, um, 
it's going to be kind of the, the Nazis dumping ground for Jews from all over Europe until they get the camps up and running. Uh, they just keep sending Jews to the general government. So it doesn't really work that way. Um, the Germans' first, secure, uh, uh, first uh, concern here is security, and they want to eliminate any potential resistance to their rule. So they plan, they destroy, they have a plan to destroy the Polish elite. Um, Adolf Hitler said, quote, only a nation whose upper levels are destroyed can be pushed into the ranks of slavery. Now, and again, as I say, the Soviet sphere is over here in the east. So these are like the three ways Poland is divided up. The German annexed territories, the general government, and the Soviet annexed territories. Now, Heinrich Himmler, who was Hitler's um, head of the SS, among other things, it was the head of the Gestapo, um, the SD, various other kind of police organs within, within Nazi Germany. Uh, he's kind of in charge <coughs> with taking care of these elements in Polish society that they wanted to get rid of. Hitler, he didn't want Poles to have any education above you know, the elementary school level, just enough to, to read enough to read signs, not to, not to go into places they shouldn't go. And they launched something called, the SS launches something called Operation Tannenberg. Technically, this was under the charge of uh, another group within the German society called the, the Sicker Heitsdienst, or as we call it, the SD. And this was kind of the, it started out being Nazi party intelligence, but very quickly it becomes kind of the Nazis' dirty tricks, dirty tricks division. And the Sicker Heitsdienst, they're organized into what we call Einsatzgruppen, or special action groups. Uh, they'd been around when they went into Austria. They used uh, them primarily to gain records, to gain the Austrian intelligence files and stuff like that. But they take on this more sinister role here, beginning in Poland. Um, essentially, th this literally means special action groups. Special action groups is what Einsatzgruppen means. And it is the Einsatzgruppen that will carry out something called Operation Tannenberg, which is the murder of Polish intellectuals. The, they, they, they target lawyers, judges, academics, high school teachers, priests, various others that they think could form the nucleus of a Polish resistance to, to German rule. They are murdered. <clears throat> um, these, these teams of SS killers end up killing about 61,000 Polish uh, targets. About 61,000 Polish targets. Now, when the Pol or when the Soviets come in from the east, what they're going to do is <clears throat> they're going to attach those Soviet areas to the Soviet republics of Ukraine and Belarus. So it is Ukraine and Belarus that 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 actually technically annex these things. The Soviet Union has about fifteen republics, fifteen or sixteen republics. And there's fiction, there's a fiction that the Soviets will keep with them all the way until the fall of the Soviet Empire, that these are somewhat autonomous, that they almost function like, like states in the United States. But the reality is they have very, very little autonomy. But, but Stalin would say things oh, like, oh, we're returning the traditional homelands of Poles and Ukrainians, kind of the same thing Hitler was saying. A lot of bunk, a lot of nonsense. But the next year, 1940, uh, the Soviets are going to take over, let's see, oh, here's, here's it. Um, the Soviets are actually going to take over, I don't have it up there, okay. They're going to take over um, the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. They're going to just essentially move in, and those states are in no position to resist them. Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Now, the occupation of Poland is, is very hard. It's very hard, obviously, from the Nazis, where the Nazis are going around killing people, but it's also very difficult in the Soviet Union. One of the things the Soviets are going to do in, in their sections of Poland is begin the process that worked so well in Ukraine and the rest of the country of collectivization. They collectivize farms. They essentially forcibly say to people who own farms, guess what? Your farm is not your own. You will continue to farm it, but now you belong to this collective. <clears throat> so peasants lose control of the land they own, but they're still expected to work it. And as we know, the government takes what it needs from the farms. It's a very, very violent process. And again, 
they also begin importing their war against the Kulaks. Um, those people that are just a little better off than all the other, all the other uh, farmers around them. One of the first things the Soviets do is they move to disarm the Polish army. They move to disarm the Polish army. And they begin massive arrests and deportations. About half a million Poles are um, face some kind of rep repressive state action here. Many of them were not killed. In fact, most of them are not killed outright. But they are sent to gulags in Siberia. They're, they're taken, I mean, whole towns sometimes will be taken from their villages in Poland and moved to Siberia. Um, and sometimes they'd be in some kind of like prison camps. Sometimes they'd just be in villages out there. And Stalin is very, um, you know, he's very suspicious and he didn't like the Poles. He had actually, part of this is a personal thing, because in 1919, <clears throat> the Soviets had actually tried to invade Poland and take Warsaw. And Stalin was actually at the forefront of that action. He was a political commissar, and of course they failed. So Stalin really had no love for the Poles. And actually, <clears throat> I'm actually reading a book right now that's quite good. It's called Darkest Christmas, and it, and it looks at Christmas all around the world in 1942 and how the Christmas was going throughout, throughout the world. And in that book, um, one thing he mentioned was, now as soon as after... Um, uh, Hitler breaks the pact, as we'll see, and he invades the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin will free a lot of these Poles that were living in Siberia. Uh, he'll say, you don't have to stay here. You can go wherever you want. And a lot of them didn't have any place to go. They can't go back to Poland, right? And they're not really welcome in, in Russia anymore. In fact, they faced a lot of persecution there. And there was a semi-autonomous king or warlord, I don't know what his title was, in India, an Indian warlord. He ruled under the British, but he had some, some, some uh, autonomy. He, his father had been good friends with this Polish composer, and, and he'd grown up loving Polish culture. So he invites all these people from Russia to come to India. So many of them have this very harrowing journey, but many of them finally get there and they settle in India, these Poles. And they're talking about there's some U.S. troops that were in India at the time, and they would, they would take care of a lot of these, there were a lot of orphans. And they would um, play with them, and they said it's the weirdest thing to see these kids in these Polish outfits doing these Polish folk dances in the middle of India, you know? And they were Americans. And it highlights, one, one thing that highlights is the way, and, and, and this is another big theme I want you to think of about World War II, it is a tremendous conduit of movement and migration for peoples, all right? A lot of people are going to be moving around the world in different ways for different reasons that under ordinary circumstances never would have done anything like that. Okay, but the war is a is a great conduit for migration here as well. Any questions about that? Now we have something else that happens. This other very sinister sinister moment here in the war. Stalin, as I say, he disarms the army and he. One of those groups, you know, like just like the Nazis fear, the the Polish elites could form resistance to them. Stalin's concerned about this too. And he has all these Polish soldiers and prisoners of war camps, and he takes about 20,000 of them into Russia, about 20,000 Polish officers into Russia, and they are executed at Katan. They are executed at Katan. This is known as the Katan Massacre. About 20,000 Polish officers are shot, and they're usually taken into the bottom of a building. They get a bullet in the back of their head, and then their graves, they're buried there in Catan, in the Catan Forest in, in Russia. And as we're going to see, this is going to cause significant diplomatic issues later in the war. This, this is what happens here. Now Stalin is looking at Hitler, and he's looking at the Germans, and he's seeing what they're accomplishing. He's seeing how quickly they overran Poland. And, and Stalin kind of like, well, okay, I'm going to assert my authority now, while it's acceptable to do so, but also, too, he kind of wants to show that he's kind of a, a big bad guy like, like Hitler is, and he can do what he wants. He is going to invade Finland. Finland. Now, Finland had been part of the Russian Empire. Finland had been part of the Russian Empire. And it had, it, after Versailles, it had gained its independence. And the real... 
sticking point for the Soviets, why they're sore at Finland, and, and what the issue is with Finland. This, I think I want to say there's only like 50 miles or something between the Finnish border and Leningrad, St. Petersburg. Leningrad, now, now the, the Soviets, during uh, the end of the First World War, they had moved the capital of Russia from St. Petersburg to Moscow. That's why Moscow is the capital today, because it's safer, it's, it's further inside Russia. But Leningrad was seen as kind of the spiritual home, if we can use the term spiritual when talking about communists, the spiritual home of Bolshevism. Kind of the way Munich was the spiritual home of Nazism, Leningrad is, is seen as almost this kind of, you know, again, if I can use the term, a holy city in the, in the communist world here. Well, they're scared that if the West did invade, the Finns might come in and they could easily take Leningrad. So, so Stalin ideally wants to completely take over Finland again. Ideally, that's what he wants to do. So in November of 1939, and it's always smart to attack Finland in the winter, in November of 1939, right toward the end of of November, Stalin orders the Red Army Military District covering Leningrad. He said, just the military district there has enough assets to take Finland. So he invades Finland here at the end of November 1939. And this initiates what comes to be known as the Winter War, the Winter War between... between, uh, the Soviets, and the Finns. Again, they expect this to be a cakewalk because their only experience in the last few years of major warfare... Now, they'd fought a little bit against the Japanese in Siberia, but that was a different animal. But their, their major experience of warfare against Europeans was when they invaded, when they went to Poland a few months earlier, right? And Poland was a cakewalk. Poland was easy because all the Poles were fighting the Germans, so it was super easy. Stalin, naively, and Stalin... Stalin is not a great military thinker. In fact, his greatest contribution to, 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 to the military is to defer to his generals as the war goes on. He still micromanages stuff, but he listens to his generals, and he lets the generals come up with plans that he then executes. Mm-hmm. But here in 1939, they go in, the, 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 the Soviets go in, and... Uh, the Soviet defense minister, Clement Voroshilov, when I showed you that picture of the marshals, he was one of the marshals that survived. Clement Voroshilov, he thought the subjugation of fin- Finland would be complete by December 21st. By December 21st. About three weeks. Conveniently, December 21st happened to be Joseph Stalin's birthday. So he's thinking, we'll have this done by Stalin's birthday. It's a nice little propaganda thing there, right? Over a million Soviet soldiers crossed the border from the Soviet Union into Finland, over a million soldiers. The Finnish army boasted about 150,000 men. So on paper, why wouldn't you think this would work? A million men versus 150. But of course, the thing about Finland is, it's Finland. And it has hundreds, literally, of small little lakes. And what those lakes do, and they're mountains, there's mountains and lakes, what the geography does is it creates choke points. It, so so the, the Soviets can't easily go and get around. They've got to move through specific areas, right? The, the Finns were aware of this, and they had really built up their defenses with this in mind, that we will hold these choke points along these things. And uh, I don't think I got it here. Uh, yeah, so there's Voroshilov, the Soviet commander there. The, the, the head of state of... Finland at this time is Carl Gustav Mannerheim. Carl Gustav Mannerheim. And they actually call their defensive networks in these, in these lakes the Mannerheim Line. The Mannerheim Line. So as the Soviets are coming in, first of all, again, the Soviets are not terribly interested in things like logistics and intelligence. And so the Soviet they'll get better at that. The Soviets move in and what they find and what they meet in Finland is uh, one, one, one author referred to it as uh, frozen hell. Frozen hell. Because what the Finns do is the Finns were aware that they had this neighbor that was very powerful and, and could be very volatile. <clears throat> so they're playing to their strengths. And most of the Finns, or a good number of Finns, are essentially ski troops. They have a lot of ski troops. 
what these ski troops would do typically is, and, and the great advantage of skis is silence. You can move quickly and you can move silently. So frequently these ski troops could move into positions and many of them are armed with sniper rifles. And they know they're shooting at officers, they're, they're leaders, right? So you, these snipers are just punishing, okay? These sniper attacks are just punishing. You're, 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 they're knocking out the command strata of these Soviet units here. But also, too, what they would do is, you know, the, the uh, Soviets had the uh, PPESH gun, which, was a, which is a uh, uh, fully automatic machine pistol. And the, the, the Finns had a lot of guns like that as well. Uh, or they would capture a lot of these guns, and they'd have some of their own, but they'd capture some of these guns. And a frequent tactic is, just as the Soviet troops were kind of bedding down in camp for the night, a bunch of ski troops would just ski right in the middle of them and hose them down, and they were gone before the Soviets could react. Okay? So these are very effective tactics. These are very effective tactics. And it didn't help that the, along the Mannerheim line, the Finns had also laid you know, just tremendous numbers of mines, and the Soviets come in without any mine detectors. So they're losing vehicles and men to mines. You've got this horrible winter condition, w winter conditions, right? The geography is against the Soviets, and the Finns are very resourceful, very smart, using really good tactics. Okay, so this is really, really causing them problems. An American journalist named Virginia Cowles, she visited the battlefield. She wrote, quote, For four miles, the roads and forests were strewn with the bodies of men and horses, with wrecked tanks, field kitchens, trucks, gun carriages, maps, books, and articles of clothing. The corpses were frozen as hard as petrified wood, and the color of the skin was mahogany. Some of the bodies were piled on top of each other like a heap of rubbish, covered only by a merciful blanket of snow. Others were sprawled against the trees in grotesque attitudes. All were frozen in the positions in which they huddled. I saw one with his hands clasped to a, uh, to a wound in his stomach, another struggling to open the collar of his coat pretty grim picture she paints there. As a result of the, this action, as a result of the Soviets invading Finland, it is expelled from the League of Nations. The Soviet Union is expelled from the League of Nations. Hitler had voluntarily withdrawn from the League of Nations in 1933, I believe, the end of 33, and now the Soviets are kicked out. Now, Stalin, this is leading to a lot of problems for Stalin. Stalin was, was expecting a cakewalk. Like I say, he only activated the Leningrad military district under a general named um, Mer Meritskov, I believe his name was. And he, he meets such resistance, he has to begin calling on other, other units here, other uh, fixtures here. And pretty soon... He's able to push pretty far in, into Finland. Um, he, he has a, an officer named Timoshenko, Simon Timoshenko, who, who ends up kind of running it and, and doing a pretty good job. Um, but anyway, he uh, is getting scared because even as he's starting to push into Finland, he's scared that any day, potentially, Britain and France could declare war on him. Now, the British and the French don't want to go to war with the Soviet Union. they got their hands full of Germany. And a Soviet Nazi bloc that is actively at war with both of them, that would have been tough, right? In fact, this, the, the, the British had actually planned at one point because of this to bomb oil fields in um, the Caucasus, Soviet oil fields. And they call it off because they say, do we really want to do this? But they were actually, the Soviet, or the British and the French were actually planning on sending an expedition to northern Norway that could... Um, protect Norway and Sweden if the, if the Soviets kind of thought they could take over all of Scandinavia, because certainly you don't want the Soviets parked in Norway just across the North Sea from you. And so they actually start readying an expedition to send for defensive purposes into Scandinavia, although some people were saying we can use it to attack into Soviet-occupied Finland if necessary. Stalin's got spies everywhere, and he, and he hears about these plans, and he is scared to death the Soviets, or that the uh, British and the French are going to go to war with him. He does not want a war with the British. What he wants 
is what he believes is going to happen is the British, the French, and the Germans will have another thing like World War I. And he thinks that's great because it will destabilize those countries, make them, make them right for communist revolutions, right? That's his hope. But he doesn't want to get into the war himself at this point. So by the end of February 1940, he essentially agrees to sit down with the Finns to make a peace treaty. And it's a humiliating treaty for the Finns, certainly. But it gives the Soviets the breathing room they want here uh, from Leningrad. So Leningrad, the border with Leningrad is much further there. They gave them some land up there. I think there were some natural resources there. I'm not entirely sure. But they also get these islands that kind of are, you know, almost could potentially be dangerous to any traffic coming in and out of Leningrad. They gain that. And they also gain this port of Honko uh, there. And so the Soviets gain all these things. But, but, but critically, Finland maintains its sovereignty. Finland maintains its sovereignty. Finland is not conquered. It just has to cede a bunch of territory. This is going to be very important, as we will see later on. Now, in this war, the Red Army took about 85,000 men killed, 85,000 men killed, and about 250,000 wounded. 250,000 wounded. By comparison, the Finns lost only about 25,000 men. The Red Army takes 85,000 killed and 250,000 wounded. And by comparison, the Finns lose only 25,000 killed. 25,000 killed. And I'm sure they, I don't know what their statistics are for wounded, but I'm sure many of them were wounded. Now, one thing, too, about this war. Hitler had desired to actually send aid to the Finns, but he doesn't want to jeopardize the pact. He doesn't want to jeopardize the pact. However, Italy which had no formal pact with the Soviets. Italy actually did send volunteers to help the Finns. And this was kind of a sticking point. This was kind of a scary point because they're thinking, well, if the Italians, who are Germany, Germany's allies, are sending forces there, is that going to jeopardize the pact? Ultimately, it's over before it really becomes a major issue. But the failure of the Soviets to overwhelm Finland here... The failure to, to brush them aside in a few weeks. This is something else that's going to color Hitler's ideas about the, the, the efficacy and the ability of the Red Army. He has a very low opinion of it. And again, he attributes a lot of this to the fact that Stalin killed his, his best generals, right? And again, that's something that's going to be very important as we go forward, is, is Hitler's estimation of the Red Army. Now, the Germans decide in... April of 1940, Hitler and the German high command, they decide that before Germany commits its military resources to fighting in France and the Low Countries and potentially reaching some kind of a stalemate like we did in World War I, it needed to do a few things. And the first thing it needed to do was so essentially secure its vital supply lines. Sweden provided massive quantities of iron ore for the Germans. Ford Motor Company of Sweden, an American company, Ford Motor Company of Sweden, was increasingly compelled to actually build tanks over the course of the war for the Wehrmacht. But because of these resources in Sweden, the Germans think, if the British move into Scandinavia, we lose access to all that iron. We can't build tanks. We can't build other things we need. So they begin to prep an invasion of Scandinavia themselves. Also, too, they figured if we are in this stalemate in, in Western Europe, if we have a World War I like stalemate in Western Europe, it will be nice if we could control the North Sea from, from Norway. Because if we can control the North Sea, we essentially can project our power... U-boats, uh, we can use those for U-boat pans and project our naval power into the North Sea in a way we couldn't in World War I. And it'll be easier for goods to make it to Germany uh, via Norway. So, in April of 1940, in or if we're going to get Norway, we've got to take out Denmark, because Denmark's just right in between Norway and Germany, right? So, they invade in April 1940 
Denmark, and then Norway. Now, Denmark collapses within hours. It's got no army to speak of. I mean, a very small army. And the Germans are just throwing everything they've got at it. So they take Denmark very, very quickly. Now, German, Germany's surface navy, its cruisers, its destroyers, is, is much, much smaller than the British navy. But in order to pull this off, the Germans have to commit virtually all of their surface fleet to this operation. So they go ahead, they send out all these, these heavier ships, which are, of course, accompanied by a large number of U-boats and transports, and they fight uh, as the Germans essentially take Oslo, but they go up the coast here. I think they actually go as far north as Narvik. They invade up, uh, up into Narvik. But they're taking the coast here, and the British, of course, are fighting them. Now, the British had already been prepping that expedition to go into Norway, so they had actually they start landing some troops further north, and they actually think they can they can they can hold the the Germans back by fighting here in the north. The problem is the Germans again are just coming in such overwhelming strength, and this 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 force that the British and the uh, had sent, and I think there were French units there too, uh, was just not powerful enough. So they begin to leave. Now there's an interesting moment here in the war. There is a uh, uh, the the to, to, to provide air cover, they had sent fighter planes. It's been Spitfire, Spitfire fighter planes to protect the, the ground forces there. And what they do is, as they begin to, to, to evacuate... Now, normally when you send Army fighter planes, it's by boat. They're unloaded, it takes time. Well, what happened was, they wanted these planes... They needed these planes back in, in England, and they didn't have time, because the Germans were moving so quickly, to disassemble them, put them on ships, and ship them out. So what they do is there was an aircraft carrier in the vicinity, the HMS Glorious. The HMS Glorious. And the Glorious was out there at sea, and it said, we can take him. And you have these Army, the, well, RAF fighter pilots, right? RAF fighter pilots. They weren't Army, they were RAF. Uh, Royal Air Force. The Royal Air Force fighter pilots. These are guys that take off and land from airfields. Not one of these pilots had ever landed on a carrier before. All of these pilots, I think there was about a dozen or so, if I recall correctly, all of these pilots successfully land their planes on this carrier. The HMS Glorious then turns around, starts steaming for England, and it is sunk by a U-boat. So it was an inglorious end to HMS Glorious. Now, the problem is for the Germans, like I said, they commit most of their surface fleet. They are going to lose one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, ten destroyers, and uh, several U-boats and, and transport craft. So one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, ten destroyers, and... Uh, U-boats and transport craft. So they sacrifice a, a good chunk of their, of their surface fleet here. Um, for, just, just to give you an idea so you understand here, and, and we'll get more into the naval war later, but, but, but a cruiser is something that's fast and maneuverable and it can spot the enemy. It's used to spot the enemy, but it's also got some, some firepower to it. Destroyers tend to be uh, smaller vessels that can provide escort duty for, for ships, but they can also hunt down U-boats and stuff like that. Um, so that's basically what we're, kind of ships we're talking about here that the Germans lose during this, during this invasion. So now we've got the invasion of France in 1940. The invasion of France in 1940. Now, these are different kind of operational plans here that were created at the time. But essentially, the initial plan, what the Germans are thinking when we invade France, and I should point out, Right when Poland fell, at the end of October of 1940, Hitler immediately wanted to turn around and invade France. He wanted to do that immediately. But his generals told him, well, look, it's going to be winter, and it's going to be much, much harder to fight in winter. And we want to do the Scandinavian plan. We need to time this thing right. So they convinced Hitler to wait until spring. They convinced Hitler to wait until spring. The original plan that is put forward by the... German high command 
is they essentially want to do the exact same thing they did in 1914, except with Panzers, right? Now, in 1914, the operational plan was a pivot. We had a point on the, on the uh, Swiss-German border, and then literally, the, the plan, is, as uh, von Schlieffen imagined it was, we're going to have literally a wall of men, shoulder to shoulder, marching along that pivot into France. We're going to get west of Paris and then take Paris. That was the original plan. Now, in 1914, when they actually do it, they don't have nearly enough men because they, they transfer their men, so it's, it's, a, it's a smaller pivot. They don't, they don't, they're not able to envelop Paris. But it's that idea. Now, also, too, critically, in World War I, they went through Belgium. They didn't go through the Netherlands. The Netherlands was neutral in World War I. But now they're saying, with this new wheel, we've got the, we don't necessarily have to go shoulder to shoulder per se, but with all the units we have, we can go through Belgium and the Netherlands. We can just do this big wheel through Belgium and the Netherlands. So this is the plan that is being developed for the invasion of France and the Low Countries. But something goes wrong. A few months before the plan is scheduled to take place, there is a German plane that is flying in western Germany. It gets blown off course, and it crashes in Belgium. It just so happened that on board this plane were those operational plans. So the Belgians now can see exactly what the Germans are intending to do. And of course, it's a foregone conclusion that even though Belgium is technically neutral at this time, they're going to pass along those plans to the Allies. So people are thinking these plans need to be altered. These plans need to be altered. Now, there's one German general. He's a staff officer at this time. And he's, he's, he's uh, I think he's just like a brigadier general at this time. I think he's a fairly low-ranking general at this time. And his name is Erich von Manstein. Now, I'll tell you right now, some, some historians of World War II and certainly a lot of armchair historians, they will tell you that von Manstein was probably the greatest general of World War II. And we'll, we'll kind of see what his feats add up to later. Um, but he, at this time, is a very low-ranking general. He's on the staff. And he had developed his own plan, which he called Operation Sicklecut. Operation Sicklecut. Now, he develops this plan, and he presents it to the general staff, and they reject it. They say, no, we're going to go with our, our big wheel plan. So, von Manstein, he's not too happy about it. He was going to be, he makes some enemies in the general staff, and so he's going to be transferred out of the general staff, and he's going to go back to the troops, which is, what, where a lot of these people want to be. They want to be in command of a troop. And he gets a regiment. Now, he begs. He begs to have an armored regiment. He wants to command tanks. And they, like I say, he made some enemies. So they send him to um, command a infantry regiment, an infantry regiment. But there was a tradition that when a staff officer got transferred out of the staff and back with the troops, that those officers that did that could have a dinner with Hitler. Like one night, Hitler would have a dinner with these military men who were being transferred to the troops. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, not just a one-on-one, I and mean, there's a lot of people there, a lot of people in, involved in this dinner. But, um, so Manstein attends this dinner where Hitler is present, and um, at one point, you know, he's introduced to Hitler, and, and, and he says, yes, you know, and, and, he, and he says, hey, did you hear about this, this plane that went down in Belgium, screws up all our plans? What do you think about that? And he says, well, my Fuhrer. I, did, I actually developed another plan that I think was superior, um, but it was decided against it. And he says, well, tell me about it. So he tells him the plan. Von Manstein's plan was not to do a big wheel, but rather Von Manstein's plan is to actually invade through the Ardennes Forest right here. The Ardennes Forest is a very dense, deeply wooded forest, a very dense, deeply wooded forest. It is very difficult for tanks to get through this, okay? Very narrow roads. Most of them are dirt roads. This is not good tank country. One tree falling over could block up an entire armored column for hours, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a not, not a good, good country to move through. But here's the plan. You would have elements of the German army invade Holland and Belgium, and as they're moving into these territories, you would have, of course, the BEF and the French army right here on the Belgian border. As soon as they violated Belgian sovereignty, the Belgians would say to the, the, the Allies, 
come and help us. Because the, they wouldn't let the, the British and the French deploy in Belgium prior to war because they don't want to look provocative. But as soon as the war starts, they would say to the BEF and the French Army, come in and help us. And the idea is they would. They'd come north. Then the German units, what they would do is they would swing. And instead of heading for Paris, they would actually head for the coast, trapping the British and French armies right there. Okay? So there's a lot of assumptions here. Hitler hears this plan, and he says, that's how we'll do it. That's how we'll do it. So Hitler, much to the chagrin of the higher operational generals and the general staff, approves sickle cut. So sickle cut becomes the, the German operational plan here. Incidentally, uh, von Manstein was a nephew of Paul von Hindenburg. Paul von Hindenburg was, of course, the president of the Weimar Republic that appointed Hitler chancellor. He was, he was a nephew. Well, Germany then launches its offensive into the Low Countries on May 10th, 1940. May 10, 1940. This is the same day Winston Churchill will become prime minister in England. Well, as soon as Hitler receives word <clears throat> that the French and the German armies start moving into Belgium, supposedly, uh, supposedly he cried with joy. He said, they're falling for it, they're falling for it. Meanwhile, the panzers are moving through the, the, the Ardennes forest here. There's a, there's, a, there's a great novel. The, probably one of my favorite novelists today is this guy named Alan First. Does anybody read anything by Alan First? He, it's, spy, it's, it's spy novels, right? But it's, it's, it's very literary spy novels. And he wrote this one. It's probably my favorite. It was called The Spies of Warsaw. And The Spies of Warsaw is about this French diplomat in Warsaw in 1938 and 39. And he's a, he's, a, he's a diplomat, but he's, he's the military attaché, but he really worked for the Duzan Bureau, which was French Secret Service. And he actually observes, he goes to the Polish-German border, and he observes in this dense forest the Germans trying to move tanks through there. So he's saying, this is how they're going to come, and no one listens to him. Really good book. Anything by Alan First is really, really good. The British and the French, then, are here. And pretty quickly they hear there are German units south of them that are advancing. And again, the initial fear is they're going, they're heading toward Paris. But they don't, they swing up, and pretty quickly these armies realized, oh crap, they're going to surround us, they're going to cut us off from our supply lines. This is how they're going to do it. This is their plan all along. Heinz Guderian here, commanded the uh, 19th Corps, as he's moving through with his tanks, he said later, um, I moved so fast that if I had been in staff school and wrote, written a paper saying that this is what I was going to do, I would have failed. Because they said, you can't move that fast, you can't outrun your supply lines, but that's what he's doing, and it's working. He's moving as fast as he can. Also, too, at this time, um, and this kind of go, goes into the heads of the generals and Hitler a little bit here. Um, Hitler actually meets with Guderian at one point during this campaign, and Guderian says, oh, my Fuhrer, we've got a plan. We're going to get this city by this day, and then we're going to take this city by this day, and this village by this day, and, and we'll be all the way here by this point. And Hitler said famously, and then what? And the idea here is German generals, by and large, that came up through the Weimar period were good captains. They were good captains. They knew how to fight the next battle, the next campaign. Very good at that sort of thing. But they lacked a truly strategic vision of how do we win the war. And arguably, Ludendorff actually suffered from this in World War I, the General Ludendorff. How do we win the war? Hitler is really the only major person in Germany asking that question. And I say this, I've said this before and I said this again. It's really easy to poo-poo Hitler as this military idiot. But the fact of the matter was, I think he was actually sublimely clever, and he, and he had a very good strategic sense for the first part of the war. And it's not until Stalingrad that that really departs him. Um, but he's thinking ahead. And I, like I mentioned, he backed the innovators. He backed Guderian and tanks. I mentioned Student, Kurt Student. Um, there is a fortress, oh, right about here or so, on the Belgian border. And this fortress is called Ebenemal. And this was a supposedly impregnable fortress that the Belgians had on their border with Germany. 
And the German general staff was scratching their head. How are we going to take this fortress? How are we going to take this fortress? And Hitler just kind of shrugs and says, we're going to do it with airborne units. Of course. Why, you know, I mean, the, why are you not even considering this? It was very obvious to him. And literally what they did was when they took the fort, the fort had a flat roof. They landed glider troops on top of the roof, and they literally tossed grenades down into the air vents. And the guys came running out of the, out of the uh, building, and they were able to take the fort, right? And it was Hitler's idea. So I think Hitler was actually, like I say, quite a better general in a lot of senses than a lot of people want to give him credit for. Because we don't like him and he's evil and we hate his guts, we have to be able to say, okay, but this is what actually happened, okay? Well, so the, you can see here, this is the advance. It begins on May 10th. You can see the advance. You're already moving into Belgium here, but you can see this bulge that they're creating through the Ardennes forest. And, and, and I should point out, too, prior to World War II, what did the French build that was going to be their big defensive network? The Maginot Line, right? The Maginot Line. Now, the Maginot Line was, in, it was built along the, the French-German border. Ah. Along the French-German border. And the whole point of the Maginot Line, because when I, I remember when I was a kid, I first heard about this, they said, yeah, they spent all this time and money building this great big Maginot Line, and then the Germans just went around it, as though that never occurred to the French. The fact of the matter was the French built the Maginot Line because they didn't want to pay for a massive military, and they thought this will defend the, 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 the French border. Because remember, during World War I, you had that massive line of defensive, defenses from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Well, the Maginot Line was designed to take up probably about two-thirds of that line, right? Which is these, these big mountainous defenses, which head-on the Germans are not going to take. The Maginot Line in World War II actually does exactly what it was supposed to do. It meant that with the Maginot Line here, the French could concentrate their forces here and have a mobile defense all along here. The problem is the French army just wasn't up to the task. One of the big reasons why the French are going to fail in this battle, and there's a great book by Alistair Horne called To Lose a Battle, France, 1940. But the, one of the big reasons why the French lose this battle is um, really because of systems of command. The French arguably had some better weapons here than the Germans, had more men. Their morale was in the toilet. French morale was in the toilet. But critically, you have these, these officers leading field armies, leading corps, leading divisions. And no one wanted to take the initiative. Meaning, a French division general would think, well, here's an opportunity, I can attack, I gotta call my corps commander. And then he calls the corps commander. The corps commander says, uh, well, I'm not sure. Let me call, let me call the, uh, the, 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 the army commander. Hey, uh, should I attack? And then he says, well, well this, is, this is a division, this is operational stuff, this is beyond my thing, so it, it's up to the divisional commander. And it'd go back and forth like that, meanwhile the opportunity is passing. What we're looking at here is the advance of the German army through the Ardennes forest. You've got some encroachments up here, but basically your, your fist, your striking power is going through there with the British and the French trapped further up in Belgium. Thank you. And we can see, so this is the uh, situation on 16 May 1940. This is 21 May. So you can see that. You can see how far they <laughs> advance like that. They succeed in cutting off the bulk of the British and the French uh, forces <clears throat> in this pocket that is increasingly shrinking day by day. And this presents a crisis of the first order for the British because essentially their entire army, mobilized army, is in northern France at this time. Um, the French also have a considerable chunk of their army here as well in this pocket. So this, this pocket continues to shrink and shrink and shrink, and the plan is working just as the, as the Germans believed it would. Eventually, eventually, we've got a few of these coastal cities here, Calais, Dunkirk, um, Boulogne, and it becomes very obvious to the British at this point, uh, we have to evacuate. We have to evacuate. And the fear is that if we don't evacuate, 
the forces, then we, we simply will not be able to prosecute the war. We will not have the, the manpower. The downside is, assuming if they can evacuate, it's not even a foregone conclusion they can do this, but assuming they could evacuate, you're going to be leaving behind all of your tanks, your heavy artillery pieces, your ammunition dumps, your supply dumps. So you're literally, this, is, this operation will be just about getting out the men. Just getting the men out, okay? And they kind of have to throw what little forces they have to kind of hold the Germans at bay long enough in order to get the men out of the beach. So the, Ger the uh, British are going to launch something called Operation Dynamo. And if you saw the film Dunkirk, of course, that's what this is all about. <clears throat> but this, this um, moment here during Operation Dynamo, this is one of the, if not the scariest moments of World War II. As this is playing out in the beaches of northern France, you have another drama playing out in London. You actually have a peace party begin to appear that says to Winston Churchill, and remember, Churchill has only been prime minister now for a few weeks. He becomes uh, prime minister on uh, May 10th, okay? And a lot of people wanted him to be prime minister because they wanted him to be the guy that surrenders. They wanted him, that they didn't want to be in a position to be prime minister to surrender, but they wanted Churchill to be in a position where he would surrender. But of course, Churchill will not even entertain the idea because Churchill probably better than anyone, understands Hitler. And he understands you can't do deals with Hitler. You know, if we make a deal with Hitler he'll break today, he'll break it tomorrow. So Churchill is adamantly opposed to any kind of deal. The peace party in, in Britain centers on a fellow by the name of Lord Halifax. <clears throat> and Lord Halifax... Um, the Holy Fox, they called him. He was a very good <clears throat> diplomat and member of government. And he desperately does not want to see a repeat of what happened in, in World War I with all of the death, with continued fighting. But at the same time, he, does not, uh, he doesn't think Britain can win. Germany is far too powerful. And most logical people, rational people looking at the situation, would think he was right. There's no way Britain could win this battle. So he's leading a bunch of men that are trying to put pressure on Churchill to come to terms. In fact, when Neville Chamberlain resigned, it really came down to, is Churchill going to be prime minister or is Halifax? And Halifax didn't want to be prime minister because he knew whoever the prime minister was would have to surrender, and he doesn't want to be the guy that, that surrendered. <coughs> so... Uh, he declines to be prime minister, and in doing so, when Churchill takes it up, uh, you've got these kind of two forces that are just kind of at this collision course about whether or not they're going to stay in the war. Meanwhile, the situation here is getting desperate. More and more, the, the Germans are unstoppable. They're absolutely unstoppable. And then Hitler makes a decision that some people consider to be one of his great errors. I'm not convinced of that. But one of the, one of the things that happens here, it happens here in late May... As he's moving his panzers here, he actually stops them. He stops them. Now, some people have said, oh, Hitler was trying to send a message to the British. Hey, if you play ball with me, you can keep your army. We're not looking, you know. There's a lot of stuff that's being read into that. Um, and a lot of people say it was, you know, again, Hitler's great mistake. Hermann Goering had boasted the Luftwaffe alone, the Air Force alone, could take out the, the, the British forces here. Um, but really, fundamentally, the reason why Hitler calls this halt order is his tanks had just overrun their supply lines, okay? They just, they, they needed to be refitted and refueled if they were going to actually charge against this concentrated British position. So he halts the tanks here for about a day or so to refuel. And that actually is one of the things that gives the British uh, the time to act. So they create this, this operation here called Operation Dynamo, the Admiralty launches Operation Dynamo. And Operation Dynamo is essentially the British government calls every private boat owner along the coast of England, sell your boat 
we'll just load as many people as we can. So you do have some troop transports that are getting people out, but you have a, a, just a tremendous number of private boats uh, that sail, privately owned boats, that sail to north, uh, the north part of uh, France here that begin evacuation from the port of Dunkirk that take these guys back north. All told, something about 330,000 British and French soldiers are evacuated. The way they are able to get these guys out here, like I said, it's nothing short of remarkable, because it is civilians and not the military that are enacting it here, all right? Now, as, as this is going on, as this is, is going on here, Churchill's position is very tenuous, okay? His position is very tenuous here. And that's because um, he's not only facing this assault from the Peace Party, but there are also, his own conservative party is not yet prepared to fully back him. Again, they, they kind of, most people want him in there because they think he's the guy to be there when, when Britain surrenders, and they don't want to do it. But Hitler, uh, Churchill, of course, is a remarkable orator, and he's able to very eloquently sum up why Britain is fighting and why it, and why it should fight. So there's a, <clears throat> there's a historian by the name of John Lukacs. I think he was originally Hungarian. He died a few years ago. But he, he wrote a great book called uh, like Five Days in May, 1940. It was about this. But <clears throat> he made a great point. And the point was, at this point, in May of 1940, there was simply no way Britain could have won this war. There was no way they could have won it. But they could have lost it here. They could have lost it. Britain could have lost World War II before it really even got started. And it's, and it's much to the credit of the British people, their empire, their government, their military, that they made this decision to, to keep fighting, to keep standing up to Hitler. This literally was Britain's darkest hour here. And they make this painful decision to keep fighting no matter what the cost there. With the withdrawal of you know, 330,000 soldiers from France to England, and most of the French soldiers actually go back. They go back to Bordeaux to fight, to fight further, further south. Uh, the door was wide open for the German army to, take, to move on Paris. Paris is declared an open city, so meaning they'll say, you can have it, don't, don't destroy it. We're not going to fight for the city because we don't want to destroy it. So they take Paris... And on, uh, I think it's the 17th, the 14th of June, 14th of June, you have this, the, the German soldiers marching down the Champs-Élysées in Paris under the Arc de Triomphe there. <clears throat> a few days later, on I believe it's the 17th, the, a, a newly constituted government in France under uh, Henri Pétain essentially announces its intentions to sue for peace. Now, Henri Patin, he was very well respected. He's a marshal of France. He's very well respected because during the uh, First World War, <clears throat> one of the biggest, bloodiest battles of the First World War was the Battle of Verdun. And Patin is seen as the figure that his leadership allowed the French to hold that position, to not retreat. And so he was accorded great honor. He was one of France's greatest heroes. And now at this time, he is, he's essentially the head of state. He's the president of France. They make him the president of France at this point. And he essentially asks for a... <clears throat> he asks for an armistice. He asks for an armistice here. Hitler agrees to the armistice, the ceasefire, and, but he says, you must sign it in Compiègne. And Compiègne was famous because that was the spot where the Germans had been forced to sign the armistice in November of 1918. Hitler actually went to the museum there and pulled out the railroad car, the exact same railroad car that was used for the German signing of the armistice in 1918, to force the French to sign the armistice in the same place. There was a big memorial, there were statues in this location, and they had them 
uh, the Germans had them torn down uh, as a result of this. Now, the terms that Hitler forces on the French is that they would essentially, the German army, while it's still at war with Britain, would occupy all of the French coastline and most of northern France, including Paris. The Germans would occupy this region, while France nominally would be relegated to a rump state here, and this is referred to as Vichy France, because this resort town of <coughs> excuse me, this resort town of Vichy uh, was going to be the capital of this this theoretically autonomous autonomous state here. But that is Vichy France. Vichy France. Now, while Patan will remain as head of state in this war, uh, his prime minister is this other French politician named Pierre Laval. Pierre Laval. And Pierre Laval, well, I'll get into that later, but he's the prime minister. Laval is the prime minister. The total casualties from the campaign, from the fighting in France, were about 27,000 German dead, 27,000 German dead, and about 110,000 wounded. About 110,000 wounded. By contrast, the Allies lost nearly 377,000 dead. Uh, dead, missing, and wounded, sorry. 377,000 dead, missing, and wounded. And about 1.8 million Allied soldiers were taken prisoner. So about 377,000 dead, missing, and wounded, and about 1.8 million taken prisoner. France has fallen. France has fallen. And now we have this question of collaboration. Collaboration. Do you collaborate with the Germans? Do you try to get through this? Do you try to get the best deals you can from the Germans? Do you oppose them? They've won the war, apparently. There'll be reprisals if you if you fight them again. What is just? What is right? What what does the average person do? My government has legally surrendered to another authority. What are my obligations? What are my obligations if I'm in government? What are my obligations if I'm in the military? What are my obligations if I'm just a a, a civilian? What is the right way to behave? Now, as I mentioned, when the polls when the Poles were overrun, their government flees to London. And most of these overrun governments, Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, um, there's, a great, there's a great movie, I think it's called The Affair of 17 June, but it's all about, it's kind of like Darkest Hour, but it's from the French perspective, it's very good. These governments that go to London, they're governments in name only. They don't have any money, they don't have any weapons themselves, um, and really, they're only recognized by the Allies as being legitimate governments. And pretty much their whole tenure as governments in exile, a big major part of that is literally just begging. Begging Britain and then begging the United States for money, for supplies, for military aid. That's kind of what these governments in exile are reduced to. Which is not to say they weren't doing good. And... Um, they aren't fostering and helping resistance movements within their within their nations, but but still, they're shadows of, of actual governments here. Now, Patan, his idea, his feelings are: we lost, we lost the war. We have to, to to cooperate with the Germans. They're the biggest kid on the block. Sooner or later, Britain will realize the futility of continued fighting, and 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 Britain will surrender as well. Um, he said, look at Poland. Poland is an example of what happens when Germany treats a nation harshly. We don't want that for France. We don't want, you know, a massive chunk of France taken away from us, and we don't want our people booted around and enslaved and, and, and what have you. So uh, the Germans are the new masters of Europe. This is the reality, and we have to accept it. So... I mean, he would later say, my only thought ever was, was, was staying with, my, with, with the French people and protecting them as best I could. Now, as I say, you have over a million French prisoners of war that are taken to Germany. 
at the end of this campaign. Over a million. Patan, one of his biggest goals, one of his biggest policy hopes is to have those soldiers repatriated. He wants them to come back to France. Um, and that's never going to happen. The Germans are going to keep them in France throughout the war, largely because they're essentially going to be uh, laborers. They're going to use them as laborers. But the French, additionally, as a result of the armistice, they are saddled with incredibly harsh occupation payments. Essentially, they have, the French have to pay for the German occupation. They have to pay the Germans for the, for the occupation of, Germ uh, of uh, France. Now, Patan himself, I mean, he, like I say, he wants to try to mitigate the suffering of the French people, and there's probably something to that. Patan himself is not what you would call a fascist. Okay, he is not what you would call a fascist. But he was a hardcore conservative, and ultimately he will become kind of a, a, an extreme right-wing figure. Probably just, not quite a fascist, but almost there. But he is forced to bring in French fascists around him. Now, one thing that's important to know is when Hitler would conquer foreign nations, most of these nations had indigenous fascist groups. The French have something called Action Francaise, um, I think Hungary had the Aero League or whatever. Uh, Hitler does not put the fascists in power. He doesn't do that. He doesn't put local indigenous fascist groups into power. He tends to put conservatives, political conservatives, into power, just like how in Germany, that's how Hitler comes to power. He made deals with conservatives, right? And so Hitler tends to put these, these more conservative figures there, but, but the fascists now have a voice. They're, they're, they're listened to in a way they hadn't been b before those things. And certainly there are fascists around, around Patan. Pierre Laval, Pierre Laval, his, 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 his whole thing too is when the war is over and the final peace treaty is signed, when the war is over and the final peace treaty is signed, we want France to kind of be the most favored nation under Germany. Germany's top dog. Germany's in charge. We want Germany to trade most with us. We want... Uh, uh, you know, had to have a, a real economic leverage in Europe, more than uh, Britain, more than a conquered Britain would have. And so they almost kind of, Laval saw himself as competing with Britain. Britain's going to lose this war, but it'll still be economically powerful. But we want France to be the, the primary nation under Germany in Europe. Patan, Laval, all these people, they blame the failure of France in World War II in 1940. They blame the failure of France on the Republic. Now, the republic that is, that is destroyed here was the Third Republic, the Third French Republic. It had been, it had been in existence since 1871, after the Franco-Prussian War. And it was always relatively weak. And France, France always has this power, problem of political power um, dating back to at least the, the French Revolution, arguably before. But the problem that France has with political power is the French government either has uh, the French president, the French leader of the republic, either has very little power and can't get anything done, or he has far too much power. And I mean, you could argue, you, going back to Louis, the, the, you, you know, the Ancien Regime, where the kings had, were absolutist monarchs. Then you have the French Revolution, and it's chaos. We're chopping off everybody's heads. The, there's no good government. Then, what do you get? You get Napoleon. And Napoleon is a tyrant, Right. Then you bring back the kings, and they're too weak to really do anything. And then you have uh, Napoleon III who comes, and he's, he's a very strong man. And this just goes back and forth. And the Third Republic was very weak because you don't have strong central leadership. And that's a problem the French are not going to solve until they create the Fifth Republic in 1958, and Charles, Charles de Gaulle will be made president then. Now, the great, the great slogan of the French Revolution, does anybody know what that was, three words? Liberty, fraternity, and equality. Well, now we have this national revolution. It's what Patan called the national revolution in, 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 in France. It's not like a literal revolution, but they call it the national revolution. And they, they get rid of that idea of, of liberty, fraternity, equality, and they replace it with work, family, fatherland. Work, family, fatherland. So France becomes a dictatorship. France is essentially a dictatorship here. Uh, this Vichy French regime, regime, you really have no elected assembly of any uh, of any power or note that's that's operating at this time. So it kind of abandons the ideas of parliament of liberalism. 
And we also have the creation of a new police force in France, a new police force. You start to see, um, two another very sinister thing that starts begins to happen here. And that is the Vichy French government on its own initiative. Now, now this probably did not come directly from Patan, but certainly from the, from the bureaucracy here in Vichy. You start to have anti-Semitic laws being passed. So you start to have persecution of Jews. And this is not coming from the Germans. This is the French on their own initiative, and they're doing this maybe to kind of suck up to the Germans, right? And these laws will become more harsher and, as we will see, more deadly as the war continues. One of the problems, too, I mean, Jews are fired from, from, from professions. They lose their citizenship, just like in Germany. And one of the big issues, too, is many of the Jews living in France were German. They had fled from Germany to France, hoping they'd be safe there. And then, of course, France is overrun. You know, again, in 1933, when Hitler came to power, Churchill famously said, thank God for the French army. The idea was the French army is going to be the great guarantor of holding the Germans back, but no such luck. Eventually, <coughs> eventually, as the war progresses, these Vichy French policemen will be responsible for rounding up Jews and giving them to the Germans for deportation to Auschwitz and other death camps in the east. So, pretty scary there. Patan said, you know, after the war, I was trying to shield my people from German brutality, but yet his regime ultimately will be a source of brutality. It will be a source of these things here. Patan's government offers a lot of support, substantial support, economic support to the Germans. Like I said, they're paying for the for, for the cost of occupying it. But during the course of the war, 58% of Vichy France's tax revenues, 58% of Vichy tax revenues went to the Germans. Went to the Germans. Now, Vichy France inherits the colonies, right? French North Africa, Syria, Madagascar, Tahiti, all of the colonies around the world, Vichy France inherits those and, and, and they administer those. Nominally, Vichy France is neutral. It is neutral. It is not taking either side. Goebbels in his diaries will write, well, are the French going to join us? Are they going to break ranks? Are they finally going to join us? You know, um, But it's a truncated, truncated France here. After the war, <clears throat> Patan will be sentenced to death uh, for what he did for his collaboration here. He'll be sentenced to death. But because of his old age and because of the fact that he was, he was considered a hero for what he did in World War I, uh, his sentence was commuted to life. He ends up dying in a hospital in the 1950s. He was an old man here. He was like, I think, about 80 or so when, when all this goes down. Now, as I mentioned, um, we've got uh, this figure here, Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle. Again, I think he's the, the, the war minister, I think, when, the, when, the, when everything starts going to crap because nobody else wants the job. And de Gaulle was, de Gaulle was a very forward-thinking French army officer. In fact, in the interwar years, he'd written a book called toward a professional army, and he's talking about things like mechanization and the use of armor, kind of stuff like what uh, Tukhachevsky is talking about in Russia and Guderian is talking about in Germany. But he really alienates a lot of his fellow officers. A lot of other French officers don't care for him because, like, the, just the title of the book, Toward a Professional Army, there's this implication, oh, we're not professional already. So he makes a lot of enemies. There's a lot of people that can't stand him. And it's funny because he is... Everybody that knew him, everybody that talked to him, said he was very formal, curt, rude. He was, he was not a pleasant first person at all, except he had three children, and his youngest daughter had Down syndrome. And supposedly he was as gentle as a kitten with his youngest daughter. He, was, he, was a, he said he was a completely different person when he was around this daughter. He loved her very much. Um, but he's, he, he's relatively... I mean, there, there's nothing particularly remarkable about de Gaulle on the surface of it during the interwar years. He's, he's not, not particularly remarkable. As the crap's kind of hitting the fan here in France, uh, he actually goes 
the, the British are coming for consultations, are flying people in to con consult. In fact, there's a brief moment here I didn't mention where Britain and France actually contemplate, the British and French governments before France falls, they literally contemplate for about half a minute creating one unified country. They would, they, it would be kind of a Franco-British union that would have one government. And ultimately, they decide against it. But um, when these British are coming to consult, one of these British guys comes, and they've been talking about this for a while, but de Gaulle essentially, as this, this British friend of his gets on the plane, de Gaulle essentially deserts. He deserts. He jumps in the plane, and he flies to London. And once he gets to London, within a day or two, he makes a speech, and he says, you know, Patan is a puppet of the Germans, uh, we need to fight on our own. So he essentially defeats or, or deserts from the legal, legally constituted French government, as much as you can call it legally constituted. And he essentially says, I'm going to fight for a free France, and he urges Frenchmen all over France to join him, to come to London, and to support him. Many of them do. Many of them choose to remain uh, in France. <clears throat> 